All right, Luke chapter number one. And what we're going to do this evening is just introduce the book of Luke. Uh, we've, uh, we, I taught Luke uh, back in the early 2000s, and, or yeah, early 2000s, and uh, we never videotaped it for anything, so I'm going to redo it. It took us a, just under four years to teach it the first time. Hopefully not this time. <laughs> And uh, it won't be because we've studied Matthew. We're in Mark right now, and uh, we've studied John, so we've got some study underneath our belt, while Luke, was, at the time, was the first gospel that we went through. Uh, and so I want to introduce it uh, this evening, and then we'll uh, get into uh, it next time. There, there's a lot in this book. Um, there's 24 chapters there's 1,151 verses. There's just under 26,000 words. It's the 42nd book. So 42nd, that's 6 times 7. So if you think about 6 in the numerology in Scripture, that's the number of man. Man was created on day 6. Seventh day, so it's 6 times 7. 7 is the perfect number. So Luke is going to point to the Lord, Jesus Christ, as that perfect man. And when we come to Luke, we come and we come really into the four Gospels, it is important to understand uh, why four, not five, why four, not one. Why do only three of them tend to gel and there's one over here that doesn't? John, usually everybody can harmonize Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John kind of six a uh, pen in that in that so in, in the prophetic scriptures in Israel's scriptures there are some statements that help Israel to be able to identify her messiah uh, as he comes there are four statements specifically there are four branch statements and there are four behold statements by the way, there are four office, there are four roles he's going to play. Actually, there's a fifth role. Uh, there's five books in Psalms. It's very fascinating, and they meet the Redeemer, the Avenger, the Deliverer, the King, and the Blesser, and they match that mandate that is given to the Lord through the Davidic covenant. So there's these statements here. Uh, by the way, there are four carpenters when you get in there and so forth. But really specifically. There are these branch statements. Come back to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. In Jeremiah 23, there are some behold statements and there are branch statements. And for us today in the age of grace, and, and by the way, we will be looking at Luke in a, in, as it comes and to whom it is talking to. He's talking to We'll never try to make Luke be to us. Dispensationally, it is not. It's the earthly ministry of Christ. Look, if you will, here at Jeremiah 23, and just notice verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will rise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall, rise, shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. There's a, there's a righteous branch and that's going to be the deal, okay? And that branch, he's going to now he's going to give us. By the way, a righteous branch. I will rise unto David, a righteous branch, and a king is going to come up. So the, in the branch statements, king is one of them. Come over to Zechariah chapter three. Zechariah chapter three. By the end of all of this, you'll know your Old Testament. Uh, quickly, Zechariah 3, verse 8. Zechariah 3, 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. So we've got another title here, servant and the branch. Come over to chapter 6. Of Zechariah 6 and verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus saith, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. So we have 
the man. Again, these branch proclamations here. Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah 4 and verse number 2. Isaiah 4, 2. Um, Isaiah says, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. You see that Lord, capital L-O-R-D? That's Jehovah. That's God. So we have a branch statement of God. Now, there's no more branch statements. That's it. We've got the king, the servant, the man, and God. So when Israel is looking, behold, the branch, and he's going to be a king, he's going to be a servant, he's going to be a man, but he's also the son of God. Now, so those are the branch statements. You're in Isaiah. Come over to chapter 42. Isaiah, well, you know what? Let's go back to Zechariah. Hold on to Isaiah, but we'll go back to Zechariah. Zechariah 9 and verse 9. 9.9 nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So now we have a behold statement. And he said, Behold what? Your king. Here he comes, riding in. So when Israel, when you see this guy riding in on a colt, the foal of an ass, and he's, again, Matthew 21, he's been pronouncing himself to be, there he is. Um, Isaiah, hold on to Zechariah, Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Behold my servant. And that's what we have. By the way, 42, 1 is how you know elect has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with serving, service. Servant, he's a servant. If the Lord Jesus Christ, which Matthew 3, is, this passage is quoted to identify the Lord Jesus Christ, if the Lord Jesus Christ is mine elect and he's getting saved to do that, then we have an issue now with pure justification. We got a big problem, okay? Hold on to Isaiah here and flip back to Zechariah 6. Uh, that was the great verse there that I dealt with a Calvinist, a five-pointer no less, and he could never get over that. He all, redefine elect, redefine, you know, it's like, no, dude, the verse, and he just, off he went. Uh, Zechariah 6, look at verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, thus speak the Lord of hosts, saying, behold the man, see, behold the man, whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, even he, he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both great passage of what the lord's going to be doing in the in the millennial he's going to be king he's going to sit and rule on the throne he's going to be the priest and also he is that prophet but notice behold the man so here we go we're matching them up isaiah chapter 40 Isaiah 40 and verse 9. Isaiah 40 and verse 9. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Ju Judah, Behold your God. So we've got these three issues. So they're... They're listed this way. They're talked about this way. So that, uh, come over to Ezekiel 1. So that Israel, when she looks for her Messiah, they were not looking for really one person. <laughs> They're looking for four different people. Or, more importantly, a four-folded, a four-fold 
uh, prophetic view of really one person. If you look at Ezekiel 1 here, this, this uh, four face, four components here is even found in the cherubs. Uh, Ezekiel 1, if you look at verse 10, as for the likeness of their faces, so if you go back to uh, verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. So what is the four faces? Verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man. Okay, so we have the man. Here's the faces. So what do we have? We have the man. We have the face of a man. Then we have the face of a lion. Who's the king of the jungle? The lion is. Then we have the uh, on, on the right side, and they four had on the face of an ox on the left, and the four also had the face of an eagle. So the ox, he's the great server, and the eagle, he's the most majestic of the foul eye of the of the empire. So again here, uh, come over to chapter uh, 10 of Ezekiel. Chapter 10. So, uh, you know, when you think about this, um, Ezekiel 10, if you uh, think about what we're describing here, the cherub, chapter 10, in verse 14. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second was the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an angel. I'm sorry, an eagle. And the cherubs were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Chabar. So the same group here, okay, all of them, here they are. Now, if you, if you run to Revelation 4 and you get a glimpse into the throne room of God, you've got these creatures there. Revelation 4, verse 6, And behold, and before the throne were, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast was a fa- had a face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now, I'm not saying that these are cherubs, but notice their appearance. Is this four, by the way, a calf is part of the ox family. We have this fourfold viewpoint here. That's my point. Now, there is a fifth cherub. You remember him, Lucifer, uh, Ezekiel uh, 28. And he's he was a supreme creature. He was placed so that he could orchestrate music, uh, using music and worship and praise of God, and yet he fell. So when he fell, these four creatures, the four faces here, what are they going to do? They're going to identify this fourfold prophecy concerning the Messiah. So when you come into the Gospels, okay, Matthew is going to depict the Lord as king. When we deal with the king, we want to know what the king says. What is his proclamations? What is he he ordering? What is he dictating? What is he setting forth as king? Matthew is a dispensational book because we're we're moving from the prophets and the law into John the Baptist and repent for the kingdom is now at hand. Luke, I'm sorry, Mark, where we're at on Wednesday nights, predicts the Lord as a servant. What do we want to know about the servant? What does he do? Can he do the work? Can he get the job done? What's he after? What's happening here? So we see Mark do that. Luke where we're going to be at here, is talking about the man. What do, we, what do we want to know about the Lord as the man? Well, how did he feel? 
What's going on here with how he feels about this? What does he feel? We get great insight from the doc, from Dr. Luke about the, the physical agony at Calvary, the blood drops and all of that. It comes through Luke. John depicts the Lord as who he ultimately is, the Son of God. And that's the part where we, we just really want to know him and what he's all about and who he really is. So when we come to Luke, we're going to see Luke is going to come from the presentation of the, of, of the Son as man. And he's going to do that all the way across. And we're going to get a deep dive into how and what he thinks about. Now, there's something ironic here. Come over with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because Paul has a similar take here on the Lord. Look at verse 17. 1 Timothy 1, 17. Now unto the, who? The king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. You know what Paul says? He's the king. He's king. Come over to uh, Philippians 2. Hold on to Timothy there. Philippians 2. Just trying to stay in the order on the board. Philippians 2, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. There's Paul. Come back to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There he is. You come over to Colossians 2 in verse number 9. And we find out, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's who he ultimately is, who he really is. There he is. So when you come into this and you see this picture begin, and when we get into Luke here, now now come to Luke 1, okay? And as we introduce the book here and we think about this, We've got this beautiful picture in prophecy. And by the way, Paul picks up on it because that's who he is in his earthly ministry. That's who he is for us too, by the way, in his heavenly ministry. Same connection. So as we do this, as we study the Luke, Luke, as we study the Gospels, really, we need to bear in mind this viewpoint. There will be times when Luke will give more information about an event than Mark and Matthew and John. Why? Because he's looking here. There'll be time when Luke will just say one thing in one verse, and Matthew will go on for chapters. Why? Because we want to know what the king says. The servant, it isn't even there. The, the genealogy of the Lord is in Matthew 3. I'm sorry, Matthew 1 <laughs> and Luke 3. And what do we have? We have Matthew 1 and Luke 3. No genealogy in Mark because no one is concerned of the pedigree of the servant. But we need to know where the king comes from and we need to understand that kinsman redeemer that he's legit. Mark, we don't care about the servant's background. We just want to know can he do the job. God doesn't have a genealogy. He's always been everlasting to everlasting. So when we come into Luke, Luke 1, you got to start in the Gospels with that premise. Several years ago, they found the lost Gospel of Judas, I think it was. And it should be added to Scripture, but not according to what Scripture says should be there. So we have a fourfold picture, and therefore we have four Gospels. Now we have a fifth Gospel, the Gospel given to the Apostle Paul, and ultimately, we're going to reign and rule in the heavenly places, which is where the adversary, Isaiah 14, was trying to get to, and you've got all of that connection as well. Luke 1, verse 1. 
For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me, and this will be Luke, also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theopolis, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke is the only writer to begin this way. He begins this way in really Luke volume 2, which is the book of Acts. In Acts 1.1, the former treatise, Have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach and so forth. He starts that with Theopolis, and we'll deal with him in, in a couple of lessons when we get down in there. But why does Luke start this way here? Well, he starts this way because when the Holy Spirit caused Luke to write, he doesn't override the personality of the human author. The, the inspiration of God is going to come in, he's going to, get, he's going to write through the author, and Luke is a doctor. And so Luke is paying attention to the details. Look at verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. All of the detail. You know, you can take the days of Herod, the king of Judea, and you can begin to identify it down. He's giving, and Zacharias, in the course of Abiah, and we use that to go back and date the real birth of Christ, and you begin to go back into the Old Testament and the Chronicles and you, First Chronicles 24, and you can dig all of that detail. That is not found in Matthew, Mark, or John. Come down to verse 24. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent for God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The detail, it's very specific. If you come over to chapter 2 in verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Exact details. You can go. Google it, look it up, search it, figure it out, and know exactly. Verse 10, The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to who? All people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. All people. Verse 25, you've got Simon. Here's Simon. He's, he's waiting for the... Uh, uh, a, a, um, the, Israel's Messiah to be born, to bring the blessings to all of the world and to everybody. Verse 32, it ends there, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So there's, a, there's, a, there's more than him just coming to Israel. There's him coming to Israel, but as Israel's Messiah, he's going to bring great blessings to the Gentiles. So there's a bigger picture here being drawn by Luke in the details. If you look at chapter 3, verse 1, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of uh, Ithaerea, and the regions of he just Ananias, verse 2, and Caiaphas being the high priest, verse 3, And it came into all the world preaching uh, John the son of Zacharias. So you have John the Baptist, Verse 4, you've got him fulfilling Isaiah the prophet. Verse 6, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Matthew and Mark never say all flesh. Only Luke does. Luke keeps going to all the world. He's going to keep pressing the point that, yes, he's Israel's Messiah, but yet he's also going to benefit all flesh, everybody. All the details, if you come back to chapter 2, if you look there at verse 19, but Mary 
kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Kept it. Kept it. She didn't tell anybody but Dr. Luke. And most ladies, when they go to the doctor, they tend to spill the beans to the doctor, never to husband. <laughs> How are you doing? Fine. What you doing? Fine. Are you sick? No. You know, boom. But to the doctor, there, and you got the details. In chapter 1 with the virgin birth, verse 35, and the angel said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy things which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Matthew, just boom, here it is. But here's some more detail. All of, uh, uh, come over to chapter 4. Very fascinating here. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Do you know in Matthew 4, it's a small s for Spirit. His Spirit does it. Here is the only place where we read that the Holy Spirit is the one that's leading him into the temptational issue. Matthew, if you go look at Matthew 4, verse 1, it's his spirit, small s, here's the big s, and off he goes. So Luke, he, he gives such detail because we need to know this guy. We need to know every integral detail. And in a, in a minute we'll see Paul's connection with Luke. And I'll be honest with you, I think of all the four Gospels, we ought to know Luke the most. Because who's the mediator between God and man? The man, Christ Jesus. And who shows the life of Christ as a man? Luke does. You're in chapter 4. Look down at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth. That's his hometown. Where he had been brought up. Now watch. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. The Lord Jesus Christ was a churchgoer. He was there as his custom was. Luke's going to give the order here of how, uh, of, of how it's going to impact human flesh, man. And he says, you know what? When we look at the Savior there in his hometown, what was his custom? He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up for to read. Now, notice what he did, verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. He's got to turn the pages, doesn't he? It's interesting. You and I have to turn the pages or click the click on the... But he's, he just doesn't go right. He turns to... Notice the detail. The book was delivered. He opened the book and he found the place. It doesn't just say he opened the book and there it was. Verse 20, he reads there Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. But he, he read verse 20, and he closed the book... And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. You know what he did? He goes to Isaiah 61, the first two verses, and he reads right up to where he's going to fulfill, which is to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closes the book because he's not ready to finish out the rest of that verse. Just look over there at Isaiah 61, just so you see that. So the Lord is a dispensationalist. The Lord's a rightly divider. He just divided out Isaiah 61 here. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the, broken heart, the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. There's Luke 4, 17, 18, 19. But now watch and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. If he had kept reading, what was going to happen in the Lord's first coming? Well, he was going to, if you go back there to Luke 4, he closed the book. In verse 21, he says, And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. If he had kept reading Isaiah 61, verse 2, he, had had to, he would have had to fulfill the day of vengeance of our God. He doesn't do that. So when you come back to Luke, 
Luke's giving these intricate little detail, little things, little words here and there, because he's after the detail. I want to give the account here, and I'm going to the eyewitnesses, and I'm interviewing them, and I don't want to miss one little detail. So you come out here to Luke 5. Luke 5, if you look there at verse 12. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. See that full of? Matthew just says he's a leper. Luke looks at him as Dr. Luke and says, that man's full of this. Not just has it, it's consumed him. Verse 18. And behold, men brought in a bed, in a bed, a man, which was taken with a palsy. The, uh, Matthew and Mark, he's got palsy. They just, he, no, he's taken with it. Chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 2. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. Only a doctor says he's ready to die. What do we usually say? He's dead. He's dying. That, that compassion there. Verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. You see that issue of the only son? The other Gospels don't say that. They just say he was a son. This was her only son. Come over to chapter 23. So Luke's carrying detail. The focus is... The Lord as man. Behold the man. But he's going to tell us how the Lord's feeling about things. How, how does he go, go through things? Uh, uh, Luke 23, if I didn't tell you that. Luke 23. Notice verse 33. Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, where they crucified him, the male factor one on the right hand and uh, the other on the left, Luke is the only one to carry the Gentile name Calvary. They don't, none of the other ones, none of the other gospels do. Drop down to verse 38. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. The three, only in Luke do you know that they're, they were in three languages. The Greek, the universal language of the day. Latin, the universal language of the ages. And then Hebrew, the language of Israel. So Luke is carrying great, great detail. Why? Because that's what he wants. Here's, the, here's, a, here's a treatise. I've been to all the eyewitnesses. Luke 1 there. The first four verses, I've looked into this, I've paid attention to it, and I'm there, and I'm with you. So Luke, the gospel of Luke is going to give us great insight into little things about the Lord and the earthly ministry and what was going on and the details of the day. But Luke also is a very interesting individual of himself. And again, he should be for us... Uh, very special, and, and mainly because of, come over to Colossians 4, because of the relationship that he had with the Apostle Paul. Paul is a, Paul, and, and we'll get into Acts here in, in, in a minute, but Luke writes Luke, and then he writes Acts, and, and we're going to see this Luke here. He's mentioned a couple of times in Scripture outside of Luke, Colossians 4.14, Luke the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Here he's the doctor. Here's that human side, the man, the feeling here. How, what does he feel? But he's there. Now, come over to 2 Timothy 4. Paul says Luke's with us. Look at 2 Timothy 4 here in verse 11. Luke is with Paul at the end. Okay? Uh, 2 Timothy is the last book written. Uh, by Paul, it's the last of the canon of Scripture, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, 
for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Luke here, he, he says, hey, Luke is here. Everyone else has forsaken me. If, if, you, if you look there at verse 10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Yet in Colossians 4, Demas is there. So I've, evidently something's happened to Demas. You look down at verse uh, Oh, verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me, and I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding the Lord. And in, 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 you look like this thing about, well, well, everybody's abandoned Paul, but when you go back up, look at what Paul has done with everybody else, if you will. Verse 10, Demas hath forsaken me, he's departed unto Thessalonians, Greece to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Timothy, you, you're at Ephesus there. Bring Mark with you. When you come down here, I, you know, you're in Macedonia. You're right in that area. But then verse 12, And Tychicus have I sent to Eph Ephesus. Tychicus is going to come to you, and when you come, bring Mark. You see, Luke has, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul has put these guys all out in the ministry. He's like, don't come hang out at the prison with me, man. You ain't getting the job done. Go to work. My time's at hand. I'm about to die. You need to go to work. Let's get on with the work. Let's get moving. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And I know, you know, Paul, they've all forsaken me, but they're not forsaking. Not all of them have in a bad way, okay? They're out doing the work. If you come over to Philemon, Philemon, here's a, here, here's an interesting thing, and, and you can take it for what the verse says, verse 24, and he says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. And I've heard it said that that is Luke, Lucas, Luke. And if it is, great, what is he? Fellow labor with who? With Paul. And if it isn't, that's okay. But Luke was a fellow laborer with Paul after the dispensational change. Now, come back to Colossians 4, because the identity of Luke sometimes comes up and is a conversational piece, and I will give you what I think, who I think he is. You take it for who you think it is, and I'll be honest with you, in the grand scheme of it, it isn't going to matter. It doesn't change what he says about who our Lord Jesus Christ is in his earthly ministry. He's Israel's Messiah. Luke is going to present him in the portrait as a man. But just notice something with me. Luke, uh, Colossians 4, verse 7. All my state will Tychicus declare unto you, who is beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. Verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Okay? So he's naming uh, guys who are Gentiles who are working there with him. Now watch verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And justice, which is called, I'm sorry, Jesus, which is called justice, who are of the circumcision. So those guys in verse 10 and 11 are belong to who? Little flock, circumcision. But what have they done? They've joined Paul. They see what God's doing. They've been through the Galatians 2 meeting, if you will. They see that God's working through Paul, and instead of sitting home boohooing, they've joined into the ministry, fellow laboring, fellow prisonering, if you will, with Paul. They're like, God, I think about that. The body is made up of a Jew and a Gentile, and here we see Jew, believing remnant, little flock, and what they do? They came over here and said, we're joining Paul, and let's go. But what I want you to see is Paul has taken the names of the guys and he's set them out. He names some. He names Tychicus and Onesimus, and then he comes in and he names a bunch of guys in verse ten and eleven that he calls of the circumcision. They only are my fellow laborers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto you. Verse twelve, Epaphras. Now he goes back to the Gentile guy. Here's Epaphras, the leader of the church at, at Col Colossae. See. 
And then in verse 12, verse 13, For I bear him record that he had a great zeal for you and them that are at Laodicea and them in Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas. It's almost as just by the virtue of the listing, that Luke is not listed with the circumcision. So it's like he is a Gentile. And now, again, you can say, yeah, I got that, or no, let me work on that, and that's fine. But if th this makes Luke a very unique writer of any of the, the Scriptures, he is the only Gentile writer of a book of the New Testament that is not a Jew. He's an exception. And that's why he writes, and that's why when we go through Luke, you will see him present Israel's Messiah as Israel's Messiah, but also as the blesser of all flesh of the Gentiles. He's a close companion of, of the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul. Come over to Acts 20. The Gospel of Luke would have been, the, been probably the, the only gospel that Paul has, is the most familiar with because of the connection between Paul and Luke. Look at Luke, Acts 20. Acts 20, verse 35. It's just fascinating to me that when Paul lists those guys in Colossians, he sticks Luke outside of the list. <laughs> it's as if he's, he, you know, there you go. Acts 20, verse 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, when did Jesus Christ say that? Okay? It's hard. If you come on, so Schofield's got a note. Luke 14. So let's go to Luke 14 and verse 12. That saying of the Lord is not found in the Gospels. Yet Paul said he said it. And I'll give to you that the only way he knew that he said it was because he had been talking to Luke. He had been discussing things with Luke. Look at Luke 14, or Luke 14, verse 12. This is the note in Schofield's reference. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It's got a little N. N says Luke 14, verse 12. I don't see it in that verse at all. Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. There's no, it is, so Schofield's note is, is, is inadequate. Paul knew this because he had talked and spent time with Luke. Come over to Acts 16. Luke is going to give a view about Israel's Messiah in a very particular manner from the Gentile perspective. Literally, we saw those details about who's governing in Rome. Literally, you're going to get a worldwide view of Messiah of Israel as his impact is going to be upon not only just Israel and her Messiah, but then also everyone else. Look at Acts 16, verse 9. Acts 16, 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we... See how we, now Luke is with Paul, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathered that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came, we came with a straight course. See? So, I, evidently, what do we have here? 1610, we have a we. Come over to chapter 21. Three times we have this we. Chapter 21, the first eight verses. Verse 1, and it came to pass that, 
I was looking for the verse just to cut time. All right. Verse 15, and after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us. See, Luke has joined the travel, the band. And you come over there in, in, in Acts 27 there, all the way down into chapter 28, and it's a we, we, we. He's joined them. So Luke, the, Paul has spent time with Luke, Luke is presenting the Lord as who he is, the man. This, he's Israel's Messiah, but the goal is to cause the Gentiles to be blessed. Paul quotes Luke two times. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, again, this is all introduction. We'll spend a lot of time in the details coming forward in the, in the coming uh Weeks, months, years, and decades. First Timothy five, and I say that jokingly, but not really. First Corinthians, First Timothy five, verse seventeen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. So there's a quote of Deuteronomy 25. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. And there's Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 7. By Paul doing that in 1 Timothy 5, he validates the canon of the Old Testament by quoting Deuteronomy, but he also says, you know what else I got on my table here is the Gospel of Luke. It's done. Luke isn't, he's not waiting for Luke to be written. Luke has written Luke, and he's in the process of finishing up Acts. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In the Great Communion, the Lord's Supper chapter passage, Luke 11. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 11. <laughs> okay, 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 23, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The end of verse 25, This drink it in remembrance of me. The only place that is found in the Gospels is in Luke 22, verse 19. It's not found in Matthew, it's not found in it's found there. So the gospel of Luke here, Luke himself, Luke, a very unique individual, potentially a Gentile. If you don't I get it, I'm not going to argue with you about it, but it's fun to look at. Potentially a Gentile, writing about the Lord Jesus Christ and that prophetic manifestation of him being the man. Okay? He's the going to present the Lord as the perfect man. He's going to delve into how the Lord felt and what was going through his mind when he, when he goes through ministry. Paul picks up Luke, and, and Luke joins Paul. And, and really, Luke is going to join Paul because of the Acts ministry, because he's there with Acts. But Matthew doesn't. Matthew is a what? He's a, he's a Jew. Mark is a Jew. John is a Jew. He's a, John's an apostle. So they're not going to go and join in, but yet that little dude right there, that little Gentile, he's like, man, you're the Gentile, you're the apostle of the Gentiles. Here we go, let's go. So when you come to Luke, look at look at get Matthew 15 and get Luke 19. It's very fascinating to me, and and I, I don't want to get bogged down in Matthew 15 and Luke 19. The purpose of the Gospel of Luke is to, is, to give, is to give that earthly ministry of Christ, but to give it as a picture of Israel's Messiah from a Gentile perspective. Notice Matthew 15, verse 24. 15, 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay? Now look at Luke 19. 
Matthew 15, he sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Look at Luke 19. Luke 19 and verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. He doesn't say, I've come to, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, hey, salvation is here at Zacchaeus' house because he's a son of Abraham. Look at Luke 13. He just says it just a little different. Look at Luke 13. Luke 13 and verse 16. And ought not this woman... Being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound low these days. See that daughter of Abraham? It's, it's as if Luke is honing in on the seed of Abraham. It's, he's looking at this as, hey, what is the seed of Abraham going to bring to the families of this earth? Genesis 12. He's going to bring a blessing to the Gentiles. So here's a picture of Jesus Christ as king of Israel, as Israel's Messiah, and that impact out there to the whole world now, if Israel would get their act together. Because Luke is going to nail Israel just as the Lord does. Why? Because it's the Lord's earthly ministry. Okay? Just a few more minutes here, because Luke writes Luke, that's volume 1, and then the book of Acts is volume 2. In Luke, we see Christ at work in, his, in person and who he is. In Acts, we begin to see Christ at work through Paul. Get Luke 4. Just, just notice the comparison here, if you will. So get the book of Luke, the book of Acts. We'll do this quickly, and we'll call it good for tonight. And uh, you can email me about Luke being a Gentile or not, and that's fine. I, I, I enjoy the conversation. I just said it's my opinion. It's my personal opinion. I don't require you to hold to it at all, and you can be wrong if you like, okay? All right, Luke 4, verse 16. I get a little chuckle out of the room. Luke 4, verse 16. Again, about the Lord. As he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was. See that? Look at Acts 17. And how, notice how he says this. Acts 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was. See, custom was, manner was. Luke 4, verse 29, says, And he rose up and thrust him out of the city. You come back over to Acts 14. Paul's climbing the wall. Acts 14, 19, 14, 19, whoops, helps to be in the right chapter. 14, 19, he says, and, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city. Luke's going to record things about Christ on earth. And then you see in the record about Paul, similar language. Similar writing. Luke 19 and verse 47, they're going to destroy. They're plotting to destroy the Messiah. Luke 19, 47, and he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him. In Acts 21, verse 31, what do they do? And they went about to kill him. Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Luke 23, they find no fault with the, with the Lord. In Acts 23, they find no evil is found in Paul. You go to Luke 23, Pilate says he's not worthy of death. In Acts 25... You've got Felix, and you know what Felix says? He ain't worthy of death. Same, term, same language about the Lord and about Paul. 
You come over there to Acts 22 and verse 22. And they gave him audience unto this word. And then lifted up their voice and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. From the earth. I mean, they're the one to kill him. And it is not fit that he should live. You know what they said in Luke 23 about the Lord? Away with him. We'll have no king but away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. So you've got the Holy Spirit using Luke to record the earthly ministry of the Lord as who he is. Come over to Luke 4. Luke 4. And then to come in and record the ministry of the Apostle Paul in that written indictment against the nation of Israel. Now, just real quick here as we end. Luke 4, just notice something here in verse 25. Luke 4, 25. But I tell you a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. So that's Elijah when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Serapia, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. That's a Gentile woman, by the way, 1 Kings 17. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, say Naaman the Syrian. Name, she's a Gentile man. That's a Gentile man. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Why would they be filled with wrath? I'm talking about a bunch of Gentiles. God blessing Gentiles. And rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereon they, the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through in the midst went in his way. What, are they, what does Luke say? He Hey, you know what the Lord Jesus Christ is here to do? He's here to bring blessings, not only to Israel, get Israel right, but also to bring in that blessing to the Gentiles. Now, we'll start the book next time. Time's up. The hour's up. But just get the feel here. Luke is, Luke is going to present that perfect man. And we're going to see as we go into the Gospel of Luke, how does the Lord feel about some things here? What's going through his mind? The more intimate thought process. And we're going to see that as Luke develops the eyewitness accounts for the most excellent Theophilus, and we'll see that next time. Now, again, don't get hung up on Luke being a Gentile. Just know, it just for me, there's just such a familiarity and a, a desire of, yes, he's Israel's Messiah, but he's also going to bless the Gentiles, okay? All right. Dear Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your book, for the Word, we can study it, we can get into it, we can dig out the little nuggets of it, we can rejoice in them, and we can rejoice in everything that you've given to us through that. In your name we pray, amen.